Welcome everyone to the seventh annual Classics and English Lecture at the University of Oxford. It is an enormous pleasure today for me to welcome uh, today's lecturer, Professor Tanya Pollard, um, Professor at Brooklyn College and the Graduate Center CUNY in, in New York. Tanya is very well known to the classics and English community in Oxford, having herself some years ago uh, been an undergraduate at, at Magdalen College and has remained uh, in multiple conversations with people who are working at that intersection between classics and English. So welcome, Tanya, very, very much. Uh, for those people who are not aware of, of, of Tanya's work, I think perhaps um, the standout publication for many of us, particularly at the APGRD, uh, is the brilliant 2017 Greek Tragic Women on Shakespearean Stages. Uh, if anyone doubted the significance of Greek tragedy at this time, and, and Tanya had already given multiple hugely persuasive papers. I think following the publication of that book, um, the idea still abroad, I think in certain circles, that only Seneca was a model at this time has been put to rest. But Tanya's exciting books on the early modern period began considerably earlier, I think of Drugs and Theatre in Early Modern England of 2005. But I also think, and I, I've been struck as I've been reviewing her publications, um, of those really exciting um, co-edited volumes that she's worked on when um, she's brought together, I think, really important um, developments in classical reception studies, but also developments that have come out of the wider humanities and perhaps had been current in English, but those in classics hadn't yet quite got there. And I think about um, a book that I was privileged um, to kind of hear uh, at an early stage, Shakespeare, uh, Shakespearean Sensations, Experiencing Literature in Early Modern England of 2013. Part of what was then obviously a much wider sensory turn um, that was indeed um, of considerable interest uh, in classics. But I've, and, and more recently perhaps, and, and similarly, the reader in tragedy. And I think that is something for those of us who work on performance realize um, in the early modern period is so important that reading in the wider sense was always um, engaged on some level with performance and vice versa. Uh, so I'm then also thinking about the co-edited volumes with Tania Dimitriou, Milton Drama and Greek Texts of 2017, and then Homer and Greek Tragedy in Early Modern England's Theatres uh, of 2017, um, a special issue of classical receptions journal. And then more recently, many of you will know that Tanya's uh, edition of Johnson's The Alchemist is just about to appear, or shortly to appear, with Arden Early Modern Drama. Uh, and what we're going to hear today um, in the lecture, Actors and the Remains of the Dead, is part of um, Tanya's latest project, which is on uh, Shakespeare's actors. So Tanya, huge welcome and we're very excited and over to you. Thank you so much Fiona for that lovely invitation and thank you so much to the APGRD for inviting me and also to Claire Barnes as well as Fiona for organizing this and thank you all for coming. So I want to start by asking what do actors do and how do they do it? In Attic Nights, the second century BCE author, Aulus Gellius records a noteworthy story about the actor Polis from the fourth century BCE. There was in the land of Greece, Gellius reports, an actor of wide reputation who excelled all others in his clear delivery and graceful action. They say that his name was Polis and he often acted the tragedies of famous poets with intelligence, 
and dignity. This Polis lost by death a son whom he dearly loved. After he felt that he had indulged his grief sufficiently, he returned to the practice of his profession. At that time, he was to act the elector of Sophocles at Athens, and it was his part to carry an urn, which was supposed to contain the ashes of Orestes. The plot of the play requires that Electra, who is represented as carrying her brother's remains, should lament and bewail the fate that she believed had overtaken him. Accordingly, Polis, clad in the mourning garb of Electra, took from the tomb the ashes and urn of his son, embraced them as if they were those of Orestes, and filled the whole place, not with the appearance and imitation of sorrow, but with genuine grief and unfeigned lamentation. Therefore, while it seemed that a play was being acted, it was in fact real grief that was enacted. Polis's urn gives material form to two layered paradoxes. Within the play, Electra's grief is real, but based on deception. The urn that she believes contains Orestes' ashes is in fact empty because Orestes is still alive. Polis's performance both repeats and reverses the irony built into the play. By grieving the ashes of his own child instead of an empty urn, he raises questions about the relationship between acting and experience, between performing emotion and feeling emotion. As both Mark Ringer and Leah Frank Holford Strevens have observed, Polis's urn offers an eerie precursor of the method actor's personal object, which Stanislavski and Strasberg described as an emotionally evocative personal item used to stimulate the actor's identification with her, his or her role, activating affective memory to recreate a personal response to a moving experience. Strasberg himself cited Polis's urn as an example of a personal object. But the urn isn't just any object. It, or more accurately, the ashes it contains, bring the remains of another body onto the stage. Beyond triggering memories and emotions, it prompts physical contact between two actual people, the performer and his son, the mourner and the mourned, complicating our understanding of acting as a form of fiction. According to Gellius, Polis is neither pretending nor straightforwardly surrendering himself to his own personal emotion. He presents genuine grief and unfeigned lamentation, but he performs them deliberately after he felt that he had indulged his grief sufficiently and in a manner that persuaded the audience that a play was being acted. Although the grief is personal, his careful deployment of it is professional. Gellius does not suggest that Polis's approach was representative of ancient acting. Quite the contrary, the anecdote is memorable precisely because of its distinctiveness. But in the early modern period, the story of his urn became emblematic of a particular genre, stories about classical actors honing their craft. As Holford Strevens and Hans Behren have reported, Attic Nights circulated widely, and Polis's story in particular prompted arguments about the nature of acting from writers including Justice Lipsius in 1584, Lorenzo Giacomini in 1587, Louis de Cressol in 1620, and Georges de Scudery in 1639. But Polis's legendary skill would also have been familiar from sources beyond Gellius. In Philemon Holland's 1603 translation of the Moralia, Plutarch refers to Polis, the famous actor and stage player, and repeats a story about Polis, the actor of tragedies, that when he was three score years old and ten, he acted eight tragedies within the space of four days, a little before his death. As we know from Shakespeare's plays, Plutarch had a strong following in London's theatrical circles. Polis's reputation as a virtuoso actor of tragedy would have been well known. Polis was one of many actors from antiquity whose professional skill caught the interest of early modern thinkers. Stories about classical actors circulated in a number of texts, but Plutarch was a particular treasure trove, as colorful and gossipy as he was easy to access. Among his examples, he pays homage to the actor who, for his rare gift and dexterity, was called Hystere, of whose names 
all other afterwards were termed histriones. Referring to the comedian actor Strato, Plutarch reports, he was then in so great name and reputation that there was no talk but of him. He tells us how the orator Demosthenes gave Neoptolemus, a famous actor or stage player, 10,000 drachmas of silver to teach him for to pronounce long periods and sentences with one breath. And in a story almost as striking as that of Polis, Plutarch described Theodorus, the tragedian, whose wife, when the time drew near, that such poets and actors were to strive for the best game, would not suffer him to lie with her, but after he was returned home from the theater, where he had gotten the victory and gained the prize, when he came toward her, she kissed and welcomed him home with these verses, O noble son of Agamemnon, now to do with me your will, good leave have you. As classicists beginning with John O'Connor have argued, Theodorus, like Polis, seems to have been playing Sophocles' Electra. The words spoken by his wife are from that play's second and third lines. As the prize-winning actor, he would have played the protagonist. And to be deprived of the marital bed is to be a Lectra, the pun that forms Electra's name. Also like Polis, Theodorus seems to have practiced a version of method acting, though not by his own choice. With an eye to protecting his performance, his wife apparently barred him from spending his passions in order to preserve their force on stage. Why do these anecdotes matter? Stories about successful actors offered early moderns more than historical curiosities. Just as English writers invoked classical playwrights and amphitheaters as models for new theatrical experiments, they looked to classical actors as examples of professional commitment to the art of impersonation. 16th century critics define new poetic talents by analogies with classical counterparts. Famously, Francis Mears reported that the sweet, witty soul of Ovid lives in mellifluous and honey-tongued Shakespeare, and identified Shakespeare, as well as several other playwrights, with these tragic poets who flourished in Greece, Aeschylus, Euripides, Sophocles. Ben Jonson similarly insisted he would call forth thundering Aeschylus, Euripides, and Sophocles in search of peers and models for Shakespeare's dramatic talent. But these prominent past icons of playwriting offered templates for imagining and building new poetic careers. Like Mears and Johnson, we look at past playwrights as the literary lions of their day. But in the actual playhouses, poets were neither the only nor necessarily the most important artists. Aristotle claimed that actors have greater influence on the stage than the poets, a ranking that resonates in early modern playbooks, which often prioritized listing the playing company above and sometimes instead of the actor. The 1597 quarto edition of Romeo and Juliet, for example, reads an excellent conceited tragedy of Romeo and Juliet, as it hath been often with great applause played publicly by the right honorable, the Lord of Hunston, his servants. Shakespeare's name does not appear. The 1600 quarto of Much Ado About Nothing lists Shakespeare's name, but in much smaller type underneath the more prominent attribution, as it hath been sundry times publicly acted by the right honorable, the Lord Chamberlain, his servants. It's not surprising then that alongside his literary parallels, Mears also listed analogies between classical and Elizabethan actors. As Antipater Sidonius was famous for extemporal verse in Greek, he wrote, so was our Tarleton. Aristotle praised his Theodoretus, a skilled actor of tragedies, Cicero, his Rossius, we English, our Tarleton, in whose voice and countenance all jovial affections, in whose intellectual mind clever wits dwell, and so is now our witty Wilson, who for learning and extemporable wit in his faculty is without compare or compare. Thomas Haywood similarly turned to the authority of antiquity to praise actors. In the Apology of Actors, he lists great performers, including one Rupilius, a rare tragedian, another called Erosus, another called Theocrines, who purchased him a great applause one Aesopus who bear the praise, Libericus, one Theodoretes, the best tragedian in his time, and especially Rossius, 
for whom the eloquent orator and excellent statesman of Rome, Marcus Cicero, for his elegant pronunciation and formal gesture called his jewel. This long running list of stars is the foundation for Haywood's book's central argument that acting is an art, a valuable one, and one worth both pursuing and honoring. Haywood's list also serves as a springboard for him to defend newer theatrical stars. He writes that he wants to do right to our English actors as Nell, Bentley, Mills, Wilson, Cross, Lanham, and others, as well as to remember Tarleton in his time gracious with the Queen, his sovereign, and the people's general applause, whom succeeded Will Kemp as well in the favor of Her Majesty as in the opinion and good thoughts of the general audience. Gabriel, Singer, Pope, Phillips, Sly, all the right I can do them is but this, that though they be dead, their deserts yet live in the remembrance of many. Among so many dead, let me not forget one yet alive, in his time the most worthy, Master Edward Allen. This catalog of praiseworthy English actors is impressively large, encompassing many of the best known actors from both Haywood's own moment and from near memory. Kemp, Pope, Phillips, and Sly were members of the Lord Chamberlain's Men, Shakespeare's original playing company, and Phillips and Sly had remained part of that company when they became the King's Men in 1603. Allen was the star actor of the Admiral's Men. Tarleton's comedic fame lingered long after his death. Yet surprisingly, Haywood glaringly omits the London star most often equated with the best of classical acting. In a funeral elegy on the death of the most famous actor, Richard Burbage, attributed to his fellow Kingsman company member, John Fletcher, the actor is described as England's great Rossius, for what Rossius was more to Rome than Burbage was to us. Fletcher closes the elegy by wishing that every eye may read and reading weep, tis England's Rossius, Burbage, that I keep. Burbage both was and was not England's Rossius. There's an obvious logic in pairing England's most famous actor with Rome's, but the two men are not precisely matched. Rossius was known for comedy, while Burbage was defined by tragedy. Fletcher's elegy highlighted his performances as young Hamlet, old Hieronimo, King Lear, the grieved Moor, and more besides. He pronounced Burbage the best tragedian ever played and insisted no man can act a grief or act so well. Other contemporary praise similarly highlighted Burbage's legacy as a tragic actor. If English actors, like playwrights, channeled their classical precursors, we might say that it was the soul of Polis that lived in honey-tongued Burbage. In particular, Burbage's legacy has potent analogies with the story of the Ashfield urn. Like Polis, Burbage is known for his onstage intimacy with the remains of the dead. His most famous role is probably that of Shakespeare's original Hamlet, first staged in or around 1599. In a play preoccupied by problems of mourning, Burbage's Hamlet famously toys with a series of skulls in a graveyard. As a gravedigger tosses a skull in the air while singing, Hamlet reflects that skull had a tongue in it and could sing once. When the digger tosses another skull, he similarly muses, there's another, why may not that be the skull of a lawyer? When the grave digger flourishes forth yet another skull, noting here's a skull now, this skull has lain in the earth three and 20 years, Hamlet is moved to ask whose was it, prompting a disorienting moment of recognition. This same skull, sir, the grave digger tells him, was Yorick's skull, the king's jester. This scene's apparent familiarity can blind us to its strangeness. The rapid multiplication of skulls combined with the grave diggers apparently cavalier skull juggling lends the exchange a darkly burlesque comic tone, undercutting the seriousness of the funeral ceremonies that frame it. In the screenplay for, this, for his film version, Kenneth Branagh quipped, if there were any more of these bloody things, he could set up a skull shop. Even in its own time, the play's relentless parade of skulls was both cliche and disconcertingly new. Critics have traced its roots to a long line of memento mori imagery 
and Phoebe Spinard has called Hamlet's graveyard scene one of the last orthodox uses of the memento mori on the English Renaissance stage. Yet the actual staging of skulls seems to be new to the play. Roland Fry has described the scene as, as far as we can now tell, a striking innovation on the London stage when he introduced it. And Andrew Sofer has similarly called it apparently the first known scene in English Renaissance drama to be laid in a graveyard and the first scene in which skulls are used as stage properties. Skulls, of course, are not just any stage properties, especially in a play crowded with corpses, ghosts, memories, and grief. These relics of the dead conjure Hamlet's murdered father, whose ghost opens the play. They recall Ophelia, whose recent suicide has occasioned the grave digging on which Hamlet intrudes. They mirror Hamlet, whose fixation on death consumes the play, and they foreshadow the onslaught of other lifeless bodies that will soon litter the stage. Most strikingly, when one of the skulls acquires a name and a history, it prompts a sudden surge of feeling in Hamlet. Hamlet's response to the skull's identity has become so well-worn that by now it can hardly be separated from parody, but its vehemence makes an abrupt break from the scene's morbid comedy. Alas, poor Yorick, he exclaims. I knew him, Horatio, a fellow of infinite jest, of most excellent fancy. He hath borne me on his back a thousand times, and now how abhorred in my imagination it is. My gorge rims at it. Here hung those lips that I have kissed, I know not how oft. Where be your jibes now, your gambles, your songs, your flashes of merriment that were wont to set the table on a roar? Not one now to mock your own grinning, quite chapfallen? Now get you to my lady's chamber and tell her, let her paint an inch thick, to this favor she must come. Make her laugh at that. Yorick skull touches Hamlet, both literally and figuratively. As a tangible, material remainder, it brings back memories of intimacy with a living body, being carried on his back a thousand times, his rising gorge, those lips that I have kissed. Hamlet has spent the play berating himself for his failure to grieve his father, dismayed that even a stage player can more easily summon tears for a far off fiction, for Hecuba, than he can for his nearest kin. But the physical immediacy of the skull, the direct contact with the remains of a beloved companion cuts through his dull and muddy metal to rouse his feeling for an alternate father figure. Like Proust's Madeleine, it brings the past into the present. The skull scene was apparently a hit. Burbage went on to reenact it by wielding skulls in a series of other plays. As Vindice in Middleton's 1606, The Revenger's Tragedy, he opened the play by addressing the skull of a former love with what was almost certainly the same prop from the Kingsmen's holdings. In another Kingsman play, Middleton's The Witch from around 1613, the Duke brandishes a cup made from the skull of his wife's father, whom he had murdered, and insists that she toast his health with it. Other Kingsmen plays feature Burbage holding other bodily remains. The decorated corpse of a former mistress plays a central role in Middleton's 1611 Second Maiden's Tragedy, and various dead body parts turn up in Webster's 1612 Duchess of Malfi. Other acting companies got in on the game as well. In Henry Chettle's 1602 tragedy of Hoffman, the lead character opens the play by addressing a skeleton as thou dead remembrance of my living father and goes on to soliloquize about revenge. In case the illusion isn't clear enough, he spars with a courtier named Lorick. In Thomas Decker and Thomas Middleton's The Honest Whore, performed by the Admiral's Men, probably first in 1604, the love-struck Hippolyto reflects on mortality while holding a skull, saying, perhaps this shrewd pate was mine enemies. Lass, say it were, I need not fear him now, for all his braves, his contumelious breath, his frowns, though dagger-pointed, all his plots. See, see, they're all eaten out. Here's not left one. How clean they're picked away to the bare bone. Hippolyto's echoes of Hamlet are conspicuous, his unusual word choices recall Hamlet speculating on whether a skull might be the pate of a politician, describing another as his fine pate full of fine dirt, 
and invoking the proud man's contumely in his most famous reflection on mortality. These ongoing reenactments of Hamlet's encounter with Yorick show that onstage skulls created their own intertheatrical conversation. Like Hieronymo's cloak from Thomas Kidd's 1587 hit The Spanish Tragedy, the skull became a succinct synecdoche for the play from which it is taken. The afterlife of Yorick's skull, like that of Electra's urn, is what Marvin Carlson would call haunted. Just as Hamlet's uncanny physical intimacy with the dead Yorick haunted the period's later plays, it also went on to ha haunt Hamlet's later performance history. As Elizabeth Williamson has observed, in a surprising number of cases, the skull chosen to represent Yorick has a real human being behind it, a human being whose connection to the theater survives the death of the mortal body. The eerie residue of those real human beings underscores what Pascal Ebischer has called the unruliness or impropriety of Yorick's skull as a property. There are no records sourcing the earliest skulls standing in for Yorick, but Williamson reports that by 1755, theater critic Paul Hiffernan was already complaining about the regular use of real skulls and bones in the grave digging scene of Hamlet. To highlight just a few of her specific examples, in the 19th century, John Duran wrote of a performance of Hamlet for which a late request for a skull compelled him to loan the head of my old friend, George Frederick Cook. The University of Pennsylvania's Furness Memorial Library displays a skull signed by the 19th century actors who played Hamlet in Philadelphia's Walnut Street Theater, Keene, McCready, Kemble, Booth, Forrest, Cushman, Davenport, Murdoch, and Brooks, along with the claim that the skull belonged to a pharmacist named Mr. Carpenter, who, quote, had loaned it to many actors. Junius Brutus Booth passed down to his son Edwin Booth a skull that was rumored to belong to a horse thief named Fontaine, whom the older Booth supposedly met in prison while recovering from drunkenness, and who supposedly wanted his skull to play Yorick. In 1889, Charles Dickens told of a man called John Reed, who, after working, oh, who after working at the Walnut Street Theater for 44 years, requested in his will that, in honor of his many years of service, his head be removed from his corpse, bequeathed to the company, and be used to represent the skull of Yorick. Casting Yorick with the remains of identifiable people is not a relic of the distant past. In the 1990s, an actor called Jonathan Hartman, who had failed to land any roles with the Royal Shakespeare Company, willed his skull to the company for the part with the demand that he receive a credit in the program. The skull of Yorick is played by the skull of Jonathan Hartman. Sadly, an RSC spokesperson rebuffed his request, insisting we couldn't use a real skull on stage as bone is too brittle and the skulls get some rough handling. In fact, this hasn't turned out to be quite true. As Ebischer, among others, has discussed, when the musician Andrei Tchaikovsky died in 1982, he bequeathed his skull to the RSC to play Yorick. His plan was almost realized when Mark Rylance asked to use the skull in Ron Daniel's 1989 production. But as Claire von Kampen, the musical director, summarized, as a group, we agreed that it would be inappropriate to use a real skull during the performances in the same way that we would not be using real blood. But Tchaikovsky finally got his chance when David Tennant flourished his skull in a 2008 RSC production of Hamlet. After word got out about the skull's history, the company announced that they would stop using it to avoid distracting the audience, but they actually continued. The, directory, the director, Gregory Duran, later said, Andre Tchaikovsky's skull was a very important part of our production of Hamlet and he meant a great deal to the company. Whether fragile, inappropriate, morbid, or more, the history of Yorick's skulls has been inextricable from the history of remembering real flesh and blood people with their own stories, memories, associations. The question that Hamlet asks of the skull, whose was it, continues to resonate. What might this question have meant to the man who was Shakespeare's original Hamlet? Since 1599, onstage skulls have pointed back to Hamlet and through him to the actor who first embodied the role, Richard Burbage. For Burbage, as for Polis, acting with the remains of the dead 
would have been as personal as it was professional. By 1599, Burbage himself, like Polis, was a synecdoche for tragedy, widely recognized as both a star and an industry insider. Not only was he the leading actor of the Lord Chamberlain's men, by then the country's leading playing company, but he also had an outsized role in the history of London's theater business. As the younger son of theatrical impresario James Burbage, the builder of London's first purpose-built commercial theater, he was known for fighting to preserve his father's legacy, sometimes physically beating up disgruntled investors who claimed they were owed higher returns on their shares in the playhouse, and sometimes through other imaginative and legally flexible strategies, as when he and his brother famously teamed up with other company members to dismantle the theater from its non-renewed lease and remove its wooden, wooden boards to build the globe. Whatever and whoever Richard Burbage was, he was first and foremost his father's son. James Burbage died in 1597, and the Kingsmen staged Hamlet in or around 1599. Both Burbages were famous figures in London's theater world, and when Richard Burbage brandished a skull on stage while playing a grieving son, two years after the death of his famous father, the significance of this memento mori could not have gone unnoticed. Like Polis's urn, Burbage's skull became a symbol of the tragic actor's skill at performing grief. Also, like Polis's urn, it became a personal object, maybe even something like what D.W. Winnicott has called a transitional object, incorporating the residue of a beloved person and channeling the emotions invested in that person. Burbage is very like, unlikely to have brought his own father's skull on stage, as much as I personally like to imagine that possibility. But the strange history of staging Hamlet with skulls of real and often emotionally resonant people highlights the scene's investment in the impact of real material human remains. Hamlet became an artistic turning point for Burbage, a crossing of the Rubicon. It is not only the largest single role he ever played, but by far the largest single role written by Shakespeare, or in the period more broadly. Actors such as Edward Allen, Richard Tarleton, Will Kemp, and Robert Armin also built powerful followings, but no other actor commanded as many starring roles as Burbage did, or monopolized his plays as fully. Of the thousands of dramatic roles scripted between 1580 and 1610, Scott Macmillan counted 20 with more than 800 lines, what we might call star vehicles. All 20 are male roles, and Burbage seems to have acted 13 of them. His particular star vehicles shared certain key features that came to define his legacy, especially a characteristic engagement with the physical remains of death. In his funeral elegy, Fletcher mused of Burbage, oft have I seen him leap into the grave, suiting the person which he seemed to have of a mad lover with so true an eye that there I would have sworn he meant to die. Burbage didn't leap into graves in all his roles, but he did in Hamlet. Arguably, he did so figuratively, if not literally, in the other roles for which he is also best known. And strikingly, his most famous parts follow and closely echo significant personal losses. Just as the 1599 grieving son Hamlet follows the 1597 death of James Burbage, the 1606 grieving father King Lear follows the 1604 death of Richard's daughter, Frances Burbage, and the maddened, childless King Leontes from the 1611 Winter's Tale follows the additional losses of two further children, Richard Burbage Jr. in 1607 and Juliet Burbage in 1608. Burbage and his wife, Winifred, ultimately lost seven of their eight children, a horrifyingly extreme number, even in the context of the period's already brutal child mortality rate. Another way to put this is that the violent plague epidemics of early 17th century London saw Burbage become famous, fatherless, and repeatedly childless in rapid succession. As the past few years have driven home to all of us, living through a pandemic tends not only to multiply losses, but also to heighten our sense of mortality, pervading how we think, write, 
and act. What does an actor do and how? One of the chief tasks of a tragic actor is to bring back the dead, making loss vivid, to allow audiences to feel and grieve their own sorrows. As Horace reminded early modern playmakers, if you would have me weep, you must first of all feel grief yourself. A skull, like a burial urn, is a material remainder of the dead and a somatic spur to grief. Both objects are uncannily tailor-made for a genre that requires the emotion's physical display. At least one early modern response to Hamlet suggested a link between Polis's urn and Burbage's skull. In Thomas Goff's Tragedy of Orestes, written between 1609 and 1616, Orestes and his companion Pilates are self-consciously haunted by Hamlet and Horatio. When the two men confer with an enchantress to learn who has killed Orestes' father, they come across a skull. Look here, thou king of Greece, fond Menelaus, Pilates reflects, thou which didst bring so many goodly shapes, takes up the skull into such things as these, and all for Helen, which, when the worm's bread of her dainty flesh shall have gnawed off her tender ruby lips and left her gumless, look upon her then, and thou wouldst even disgorge thyself to see such putrid vermin to lie kissing her. Pilates accompanies his physical quotation of Burbage's skull holding with words taken more or less directly from Hamlet's reflections on Yorick. The passage forms an eerie, almost comic mashup. Thou wouldst even disgorge thyself, echoes Hamlet's my gorge rims at it, with the tender ruby lips echoing those lips that I have kissed, and the worm-eaten, gumless Helen evoking the warning to my lady, let her paint an inch thick, to this favor she must come. And all for Helen, what's Helen to him, or he to Helen, that he should weep for her. But after bringing us to the graveyard of Elsinore, Goff brings us to an earlier graveyard of the house of Atreus. Reflecting on the skull leads Orestes to meditate on his own failure to translate his grief into revenge, and to contrast this failure with the emotional power of an object-inspired actor. There was a player once upon a stage, he recalls, who, striving to present a dreary passion, brought out the urn of his late buried son, it might the more affect him and draw tears. But I, as if I had no passion left, not acting of a part, but really in a true cause, having my father's bones, his hollow skull, yet crawling full of worms, I cannot weep. No, not a tear will come. Just as an onstage skull prompts Hamlet to revive Yorick, and Burbage to revive his father, so Goff's play retrieves a skull to revive not only Hamlet's encounter with York, but also Polis's encounter with the urn of his late buried son. Goff's Orestes weaves metatheatrical reflections through his own story. Impossibly, the actor he describes is one who played his sister Electra in his family's tragedy, in a scene in which he himself appears. Equally impossibly, his meditation on Polis's urn spurred tears leads him back to Burbage's Hamlet and his horror of being out grieved by an actor imagining Hecuba. What are these skulls continuing to do on stage and what do they have to do with classical actors? To put it differently, when this Orestes Hamlet hybrid turns to a revised version of York, what's Polis to him? In the context of early modern interest in classical actors as templates for the theatrical art, we might see Polis's story as part of a training manual on the profession of acting, a kind of how-to textbook. The electric impact of Polis's onstage contact with the dead offers a new possibility for harnessing a star actor's filial grief in the service of recharging an old play whose revenge demanding ghost might have been already too familiar to Shakespeare's audiences. Already in 1596, well before Shakespeare's Hamlet, Thomas Lodge had written scornfully of the ghost which cried so miserably at the theater like an oyster wife, Hamlet, revenge. But more broadly, if the past is an unreachable world containing all that's ever disappeared, the so-called golden world often projected onto antiquity tends inevitably to conjure the specter of loss. 
In Tom Stoppard's Arcadia, Thomasina is moved to both fury and grief by thinking of the enemy who burned the great library of Alexandria without so much as a fine for all that is overdue. Oh, Septimus, she laments, can you bear it? All the lost plays of the Athenians, 200 at least by Aeschylus, Sophocles, Euripides, thousands of poems, Aristotle's own library. How can we sleep for grief? Stoppard is our contemporary, not Shakespeare's, but Thomasina's despair at the loss of the past joins a conversation with deep roots. Petrarch famously wrote in a letter to Homer, invoking his anguished longing, your Penelope cannot have waited longer, nor with more eager expectation for her Ulysses than I did for you. If Shakespeare needed to reanimate Hamlet's grief for a ghost whom he both can and cannot touch, and Burbage's grief for a father who was both absent and omnipresent in his theatrical world, he could do worse than turn to the world of classical antiquity, both remote and insistently undead. When Hamlet asks a player to recite Aeneas's tale to Dido, retelling the Trojan War from an already belated time and place, he imagines the theater as a portal into a lost world. What does an actor do and how? Or to put the question differently, what is theater for? For Goff, for Shakespeare, and for Sophocles, one of an actor's primary jobs is to restore what is lost, to bring back the dead. The theater's necromantic art could bring back dead writers, such as the storied figures of classical antiquity. It could bring back the lost world of classical actors with their fabled ability to inflame audiences' emotions. And maybe it could also, even if just temporarily, bring back more immediate losses, a dead son, a dead father, the remains of a family ravaged by a terrifying plague. Early modern writers dreamed of reviving classical actors. Armed with skulls, urns, and stories, they worked to restore nearer losses as well. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. That was absolutely um, spectacular and um, so wide ranging uh, and and so exciting. And I, I if um, I'm allowed to, I, I I I do do have a question. And but before I ask my question, I just remind um, everyone who who is watching that you can um, either post a question uh, into the YouTube chat or you can send. Um, a question directly because not everyone um, is able to do that. They can send a question directly to the APGRD uh, at ox.act.uk email um, account, and we'll try um, to uh, to get those questions uh, to Tanya. I what really interested me and I, what struck me. Um, during the course of this amazing speech was, um, or talk was um, the suggestion that, that Hamlet is the first English graveyard scene. And um, I, I know that you returned um, to that uh, wonderful vase at the end and um, the beginning of, of uh, the coephery and the invocation of Agamemnon as part of the bigger sort of Orestes story that is clearly lying behind Goff's um, Orestes. Um, but I, I, I hadn't quite realised, and, and um, am I heading in, in um, the right or wrong direction, I suppose, the extent to which the coephery um, or rather more significantly or more, more accurately, saint Ravi's version, truncated version of the Oristia, which really foregrounds that scene, doesn't it? Because it, it has a very truncated Agamemnon. Um, the extent to which that version and in turn the coephery of, of, of Aeschylus haunts this period in 
not in multiple ways, not just Hamlet, but as you're showing, that it has, um, just like the anecdote about Polus and his mm -hmm. urn, it seems to reverberate throughout all these skull scenes, all these uh, multiple sort of Jacobean and, and Caroline tragedies that come off after Hamlet. And, and clearly, as you've shown, thanks to, above all, Burbage's uh, extraordinary performance. So um, would you like, would you sort of talk a little bit more about the importance of that Latin translation of, of the Oristia for us? Absolutely. I mean, I first want to say, I think that's absolutely right. And I honestly didn't even know when I began toying with this um, material that I was going to become so um, immersed once again in the question of um, the way that Aeschylus and the way that Agamemnon um, and his story are haunting Hamlet. That was not my intention. I just really wanted to write about Polis. <laughs> I just really have been seized for a long time by the story of the urn. But I would, I would say that Sophocles' Electra is um, probably the most central mediating text. I think you're right that the coiffury is really important here, but I think it is Sophocles' Electra which was much more frequently printed, much more frequently translated, much more frequently staged, and much more talked about. And that scene with the urn that comes there, of course, this is its own response to Aeschylus. Um, so I think there's a, a number of different levels of mediation happening. We know that there is a version of Agamemnon that is staged at the Rose Theater in 1599, around the same time as Hamlet. We know that, and we don't know, sadly, what it looked like, um, to what extent it might have um, involved a mashup or pastiche of, of Greek plays. We don't know a lot about how much of the sans revie was available and circulating actively in England at the time, although certainly that Latin sort of abridged version was accessible. But I think it's clear that English writers and audiences are always thinking of Aeschylus both through the filter of San Revy and through the filter of Sophocles' Electra, as well as through the filter of Euripides' Electra, which is also in circulation, um, and then through the filter of the kind of um, more contemporary responses that are being written about it. So I absolutely think it's there. It's a kind of ur scene haunting the urn, but it's always there in the same way that Yorick's skull is always accumulating and always accruing new associations. Um, I think that Aeschylus is always present in the 16th century through a series of, of accumulated screens and filters. Um, it's always haunted by all of the other versions of that scene that have happened since. Lovely, thank, thank you very much. And I, I, I noticed we have um, uh, a question, seems to be quite a long question, so um, uh, bear with me. Uh, the question um, is, do you see any points of commonality or divergence between these physical human remains and the presence of literal ghosts in Elizabethan drama? Do those I think that's an absolutely yeah. wonderful question. And honestly, as I was nearing the end of this rendition, I thought I really need to talk more and think more about ghosts because I think they're absolutely connected and they are quite different in that the ghost is typically not quite corporeal. Um, and I actually had a graduate student, um, Sarah Murphy, years ago, writing a, who wrote a dissertation chapter on staging ghosts. And she has written an article that has been published, I think in Shakespeare Bulletin, I'll have to find it, um, in which she focused especially on the sort of strange status of ghosts in this period as simultaneous cor simultaneously corporeal and not, so that ghosts are typically enacted by actors, which means the ghost becomes a body on the stage. And certainly that's the case with the ghost of King Hamlet Sr. At the same time, there are ghosts such as Banquo's ghost, who we don't necessarily physically see on the stage. We see Macbeth responding to what seems to be invisibility. And even when Hamlet's father's ghost comes back, the second time with um, in the closet scene with Gertrude, 
Hamlet can see him, Gertrude cannot. How is that being acted? How much corporeality do we attribute to that? The skull we can touch, the ghost, it's not clear whether you can grasp it or not, whether it shifts away. I think the um, combination of the skull and the ghost is really crucial towards expressing the paradox of the remains of the dead, which is that they both are and aren't there. We can grasp it, we can't. In the same way that, as I was sort of reflecting towards the end of the talk, the classics are both alive and dead. We have the book, we can read it, and yet the person is not there, the actor is there, we can only imagine the performances, and we can only begin to imagine how many other plays, how many other poems are no longer with us and how they might change what we have left. So I think the ghost, yeah, it's a, a long way of saying, I want to think more about the ghosts, but I absolutely think they're connected. I absolutely think they're not the same. And that not sameness and juxtaposition seems to me really important. Mm, lovely. And um, we have a question um, from Oliver Taplin as well. Um, Hi, Oliver. <laughs> was there... I, Oh, yes, dude. No, no, go on, Tanya. Say, I was say. just going to say that Oliver was my classics tutor at Maudlin, and everything I learned about Greek drama, I'm going to attribute to him, and I'm delighted he's here. Wonderful. So now he's going to be uh, your tutor again and ask you um, uh, a, a challenging question. Um, was there any reflection, asked Oliver, of Aristotle's reaction against the dominance and celebrity of actors? insisting that the work of the poet is the essence of tragedy, as Aristotle says, and can have its full effect without actors. So was there any reflection on this? I think that competition has remained acute in Shakespeare's period, as in the Greeks, and as frankly, in our own period. I think that competition has never stopped and that that tension has never stopped you know ben johnson who i'm spending a lot of time with lately because of editing alchemist has some wonderful um lines when he arranges for his plays to be reprinted he puts very specifically in the space where a lot of playbooks as we've seen will say as hath been sundry times acted in public by thee he will write as hath been corrected, no, as has never been correctly acted by <laughs> the, uh, the, the playing troupe, but is here now corrected. So Ben Johnson was always very eager to point out that the version he was letting us read was not the bad version that actors mucked up, but the real version that he, the proper authority, the proper source of the play, had put together and had fixed. Um, and Johnson, I think, was much more cranky than a lot of playwrights about insisting, like, don't believe the actors, they're not the authorities, I'm the authority here. And he famously complained about the actors a lot, although he had also acted himself and he was also very good friends with a lot of actors. So I think there's a kind of paradox to the tension. I cannot give you an authoritative answer as to which parts of Aristotle were getting more and less attention in this period. We'd have to go to Michael Lazarus, um, maybe for more awareness of that, but I do think it's safe to say that Renaissance playwrights and, and um, had some very serious attention to the question of who mattered more, and this was worried over. Shakespeare himself started as an actor, but the reason that he became well known and the reason he became financially successful was that not to do with either his acting or his playwriting, but to do with his early financial investment as a shareholder in the company of the Lord Chamberlain's men. So ultimately, it may actually be the businessmen who were the most important, um, because they're the ones who decided whether, who determined whether a company was going to succeed, whether actors and playwrights were going to continue having jobs. The reason Shakespeare was able to write so many successful plays was that unlike most of his peers, he never spent time in debtor's prison. And the reason for that is not that he got paid so much for his plays, but that he was a shareholder. Um, so the moral of that story is, it's better to have money than not to be, have money if you want to be influential in the world of the arts, which is to say it might not end up being ultimately the actors or the playwrights who matter, but the people who are in a position financially to ensure that the play goes on. I'm not sure if that's a satisfactory answer, but I think we can safely say that playwrights of the time were 
certainly um, engaged with the vexed question of who matters more. And I think we can also say that over the course of time from the 1580s into sort of the 1620s, um, there's a very clear, if gradual, shift between playing up the actors on, the, on um, title pages and playing up the authors. So authors are becoming more important over this period of time. Lovely, thank you very much. And there is one um, final question I think we have time for, um, and that's from your English tutor of way many years ago um, from Oxford, from Laurie Maguire. Um, oh. Can you, <laughs> so this is Laurie asking, can you say something about Thomas Nash and read the sixth? Say that again about something. I just lost the connection a little bit. Can I say something about? Sorry, my volume's going yes. out. Can you say something? Um, oh, um, oh, about Talbot revised and bleeding. I'm sorry about the sound. Can you hear me properly? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, what a wonderful question. Thank you, Laurie. And I'll just point out, I'll just say, Laurie was not actually sadly my tutor at Malden because she joined later, but she has been a wonderful mentor since. And I can credit Laurie with having first set me on a, a path towards really thinking about how to track the transmission of Greek books into this period because of her wonderful work in Shakespeare's names, where she starts talking about, um, where, where she has done so much extensive research on the copies of Greek playbooks in this period. Yes, Talbot revived and bleeding in Henry VI is a wonderful um, site for thinking about the bringing back of the dead and the emotional power attributed to audiences, the, or rather, I'm going to say the emotional alchemy between audiences and actors, um, given the charge of contact with the dead as a way of um, inflaming emotions. This passage I don't have in front of me, sadly, so I'm not going to be able to give as good an answer to this great question as it deserves. Um, but Thomas Nash spoke um, or wrote about um, the powerful impact on audiences beholding Talbot constantly bleeding, constantly dying, constantly being revived as sort of a trope for the ability of a play to bring back the dead, to bring back loss, to bring back grief. Um, and it's one of the many beautiful sights I think we have for, for seeing how invested the writers, playwrights, actors, and audiences of this period were in that kind of revival and that kind of re-dying as a, a moment at the, at the heart of theatrical electricity. Well, Thank you so much, um, Tanya, again, for um, a really uh, exemplary uh, annual Classics and English lecture from which um, many of us have enjoyed and learnt an awful lot now. And I know many people will continue to do uh, in the future. Um, we will say goodbye to you um, and wish you all the best. And we know that you're just about to begin a, a very long day. So thank you so much for your time and hope to see you in person very soon. Thank you so much. And thanks to all the invisible people who have come to listen. I wish I could see your faces. 